Thank you very much, uh, Madam Leila. Your Excellency, Madam Leila Benali, President of UNEA 6. Your Excellency, Paula Naves, President of Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. Your Excellency, Abi, Mohammed, Abi Ahmed Ali, Prime Minister of Ethiopia, and my guest who is on a state visit to Kenya. Your Excellency, President Hassan Sheikh, President of Somalia. Your Excellency, President Eric Mokwezi Masisi, President of Botswana. Your Excellency, President Ismail Gele, President of Djibouti. Your Excellency, President Bryce Oligui, President of Gabon. Excellencies, Vice Presidents, Prime Ministers, Heads of State, Honorable Ministers, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning and welcome to Kenya. During the third intergovernmental negotiating committee, which was held here in Nairobi last November to develop a global plastic treaty, I promised in this very hall to abolish visa requirements for anyone coming to Kenya. I want to announce here that we did exactly that. And we did it for a couple of reasons. Number one, because Kenya hosts the only UN headquarters in the global south, the largest UN headquarters in the world, and also that Kenya is the home of humanity. And therefore, to require anybody to get a visa while going home is not fair. And that is why I take this opportunity to welcome all of you home. Welcome home. The sixth session of the United Nations Environmental Assembly, UNEA 6, convenes under the theme that aptly captures the essence of what we need to achieve. Given the magnitude and the urgency of the existential crisis that humanity and life on our planet is grappling with, only collective action at the multilateral level that is effective, inclusive, and sustainable will enable international community to tackle climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. Fortunately, we are now aligned in terms of the need to move together rapidly in order to catch up with and overtake this crisis. We are propelled by the momentum of the 2023 COP28 which took place in Dubai last November and concluded on a hopeful note with a number of historical decisions. First, COP28 emphasized that simultaneously transitioning away from fossil fuels while tripling renewables and doubling efficiency is a collective priority. Second, it positions resilience and adaptation at the center of climate action, clearly defining the limits connecting nature, health, agriculture, and food system chains, as well as peace and security. If there was ever any doubt, COP28 confirmed that climate change is no longer to be seen as an abstract concern residing in distant future, but a real and present danger that requires urgent collective action from all of us. This distinguished assembly, UNEA 6, is the first intergovernmental global meeting after COP28. 
these places upon this assembly a tremendous responsibility to expeditiously deliver on its agenda in full and thereby demonstrate the power of international cooperation and effective multilateralism. This is a challenging task, which is complicated by the fact that nations of the world are also grappling with a dynamic complex of interconnected and multifaceted threats, risks, uncertainties, and shocks, ranging from a sluggish economic growth, conflict and wars, and geopolitical fragmentation. This situation is exacerbated by an alarming climate change trend whose implications are now impossible to ignore. Record-breaking temperatures on one end, catastrophic droughts and floods, escalating sea levels, landslides, rampant wildfires. If anybody watched TV last night, you were witnessing huge wildfires in the US severe cyclones which have become frequent and familiar in many regions worldwide. Science is unequivocal that human activity are the primary catalyst for this phenomenon. Consequently, as humankind, we are faced with a critical decision to radically alter our course or persist on the current path endangering our very existence. Undoubtedly, we collectively appreciate this predicament, yet our track record on course correcting is mixed. On one hand, undeniable progress has been made on several fronts. At COP28, we operationalized the loss and damage fund to support economic and non-economic losses and damages associated with adverse effects of climate change in climate vulnerable developing nations. At the same time, the adoption of the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework was pivotal in defining the actions that must be taken under and within this decade in order to curb biodiversity loss by 2030 and set the planet on a path of restoration and recovery. I welcome the progress being made in the ongoing negotiations for a legally binding global agreement aimed at ending plastic pollution, including its detrimental impacts on marine environment because it brings us closer to mitigating humanity's collective vulnerability to a monumental crisis. This highlights these highlights outline the various positive developments and are an eloquent statement to the collective determination and strategic foresight which now inspired our multilateral endeavors. On the other hand, it is important to point out that incremental steps are no longer sufficient in the face of rapidly escalating threats. We are off track and off target when it comes to fulfilling critical parameters on many indicators of action and delivery. Despite increased awareness and efforts, global greenhouse gas emissions are still on the rise. Pollution patterns are veering in an alarming direction, and biodiversity is confronted with multifaceted and escalating threats, along with the risk of an accelerating rate of loss. No economy, community, or nation can tackle these challenges single-handedly with any hope of success. Nevertheless, for all of us, all the work must begin at home with effective domestic measures. Kenya, the government of Kenya has instituted a comprehensive institutional framework to anchor decisive interventions across numerous sectors, including energy and pollution, forest conservation, and critical landscape restoration, agriculture and food systems, as well as nature and biodiversity. 
The aim is to proactively reverse the impact of climate change and promote the resilience of our people and our economy. I invite you to find time and visit some of the projects in Kenya to witness the passion, the commitment, determination, and ingenuity of our people and what they bring to these endeavors. The understanding that the people are invested in climate action agenda and that our policies and strategies must make space for their effective participation has inspired the emergence of a bottom-up climate action paradigm in Kenya, complementing our bottom-up economic transformation agenda. I take this opportunity to express gratitude and appreciation to all our partners, led by the leadership of the UN system, for supporting us in driving this agenda. I also invite you to mobilize your national leadership, as well as the leadership of various institutions in your countries to partner with us in global cooperation as a matter of great urgency. From experience, we know that the existing multilateral system is not up to the task. It is imperative for us to confront this truth with honesty and rectify glaring deficiencies which impede effective multilateralism. Our reform agenda must begin by attending to fundamental structural dimensions to realign multilateral institutions with core values of the international community, including sovereign equality and effective democratic representation as the basis of enhanced effective and inclusivity. If we fail in this critical endeavor, multilateralism in its present state might falter struggle and collapse in the face of dire global crisis, overwhelmed by pervasive distrust, skepticism, and disengagement. The time has come for us to find and apply the levers of transformational change in order to address multiple priority priorities simultaneously. Last September, Kenya and the, United, and the Africa Union Commission convened the first Africa Climate Summit here in Nairobi. The summit culminated in the Nairobi Declaration on Climate Change and Call to Action, which set out our vision as Africans for climate-positive economic growth and development on our continent. The summit recognized that our continent has the fundamentals to spearhead progressive progress along a path compatible with effective climate action by serving as a cost competitive industrial hub with the capacity to support other regions in achieving their net zero ambitions. It also called for the urgent reform of the global financial architecture to rectify its current deficiencies and modernize the entire system to meet the development needs of the majority in the 21st century. African countries and many other developing countries pay significantly higher costs, up to five times more than others, for our debt. Those seeking investments in private projects face high costs of capital driven by real and imaginary risks. These arbitrary, unjust, discriminatory, and unequal state of affairs is untenable given the pressure of time, limited resources, and the imperative to actualize a fairer and more inclusive development and responsive global governance. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, International collaboration is crucial in promoting the adoption of the reduce, reuse, and recycle life cycle approaches to waste that are vital for sustaining the blue economy and its ecosystems. Kenya's response to ban single-use plastic has proved effective. To build on this progress, we are implementing the Green Economy Strategy and Implementation Plan 
to shift waste management to a circular economy. I urge the global community to advance towards a climate neutral, resource efficient, and circular economy. We commend United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, for its role in the intergovernmental negotiations for the Global Plastic Treaty. Building on this achievement, and in line with promoting efficiency and effectiveness, I urge the global community to support Africa's position that the Secretariat of the Treaty be headquartered here in UNEP. <clears throat> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have reasons for it. The current global environmental governance remains fragmented despite the historic agreement at the Rio Plus 20 conference, which calls for the consolidation of headquarters functions in Nairobi. This governance fragmentation leads to policy inconsistencies, overlaps, inefficiencies, and wastage in the administration and implementation of multilateral environment agreement. Addressing environmental issues in this manner diminishes efficiency and effectiveness, undermining our ability to make meaningful change. Therefore, UNEP, as the global body with a mandate to set the environmental agenda, must enhance policy coordination, integration, and coherent implementation of the agreements while honoring each mandate. Likewise, UNEP should provide regular and robust platforms for exchange of information, knowledge, best practices, and lessons learned among multilateral environmental agreements and stakeholders, fostering consensus and enhancing the science policy connection. With these important mandates in mind, I note with concern that financing from the UN regular budget and voluntary uh, 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 voluntary funds remain insufficient for UNEP to effectively deliver. And I'm happy uh, Dennis Francis is here with us that uh, you will consider at the UN General Assembly the requests that have been made by UNEP on modernizing the facilities here. We are very proud that this compound where we are today is the largest UN compound on Earth. Here, we have 140 acres donated by the people of Kenya because we believe in what UNEP is doing. We would expect a lot of support from the rest of the UN community to make this facility a truly environmental headquarters of the globe. I therefore urge the UN General Assembly to secure new, substantial, and reliable funding from its regular budget to provide consistent and sustainable support for UNEP's crucial work. Additionally, I appeal to donors to increase their voluntary contributions, recognizing the urgent and vast scope of current environmental challenges. Le Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have six years left to deliver on the UN 2030 agenda for sustainable development unless we collectively undertake radical positive action. We are on course to fail. The obligation falls on each one of us to clearly identify their role in order to define our contribution to the collective to this collective endeavor. Each of us must challenge ourselves and one another to unleash and harness our collective creativity and solidarity. May the decisions and the discussions and engagements in these sessions mark a significant leap forward in this vital goal. As I conclude, I have been informed by the chair that most of the meetings 
have taken very long, sometimes ending at 2 a.m. in the morning, sometimes at midnight. You have done a very good job, and you deserve some holiday after this meeting. I just want to give you some hints on where to find a place to enjoy your time after this very uh, committed service to humanity. One is that about 10 or 15 minutes from your hotel room is Nairobi National Park. You can visit Nairobi National Park. I, however, want to warn you that um, we have a fence around the Nairobi National Park, but sometimes the lions break out. So in the event that you meet a lion on the streets, please be careful. They are, very, they are wild. Let me give you another hint that uh, if you thought it's only humans who elect members of parliament and have a legislative body, I invite you to go to Naivasha and you will find a phenomenon called the baboon parliament, where baboons meet regularly at a particular place, at a particular time, and they discuss their legislative issues. And if you have a bit more time, you may want to go to Masai Mara, where we have the wildebeest migration. And this migration is much more orderly than the human migration. They know how to cross borders, and they know how to move without causing any environmental damage. And if you have a bit more time, please travel to Lamo and you will have an opportunity to watch the swimming lions there. And finally, you may want to watch another migration called the whales migration in a place called Tana River. So, you have ideas on what to do after this conference. And I wish you very fruitful deliberations. Thank you very much.